You're listening to another Comics Pals Book Club. Thank you for joining us this time. We are here to talk about one of my favorite books, but actually not my pick. This is a uh, this is Will Brashears, and I want to say to you, Will, first of all, thank you for shouting this book out. You have very good taste, my friend, because we are talking about Kill or Be Killed by Ed Brubaker, Sean Ooh. Phillips, and Elizabeth Brett Weiser. Hey, hey. Uh, this. It, yeah, the, the gang's all here. I do want to point that out. We've got everybody full house. Even Phil. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> Phil, you absent and slut. I am being put on blast. <laughs> Don't you, just, just you wait. Oh, no. Two drinks in. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> the gloves are off. Marco's ready to go. No, no the, the sights are on. Yeah, clearly. Damn. So this is actually a pretty unique book from the team because uh, for those of you who are uninitiated, Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips, they've been working together for over 20 years at this point. They've got a really, really strong creative relationship. And at this point, they only work together pretty much. Uh, and Elizabeth Brett Weiser is a frequent collaborator of, their, collaborator of theirs. Uh, and they only publish through Image. So this book is unique in the sense that it ran for two years and 20 issues which is not typically what they do typically they don't do serialized books typically they do things like criminal that are kind of loosely related arcs uh that come out whenever they come out and not necessarily monthly by design uh or they'll do an original graphic novel that tells one singular story and wraps up then and there with no follow-up uh, this book is unique in that it's kind of, it's not a superhero story, but it definitely emulates superhero stories in the sense of how it was released because it was released monthly and highly serialized in nature. Um, and again, it was 20 issues, which is longer than their runs tend to go. And it was published between August of 2016 and June of 2018. These guys and girl told what I think is a tremendous story about one man's journey to kind of become themselves in a weird way. And I'm really excited to talk about it because I've wanted to do this book since we started the book clubs. Thankfully, it was recommended by Will. Um, I know that Marco and I are the only two who read this before we agreed to do this. That's correct, right? Yes. So I want to hear most especially from you guys, not what you expected only from the book, but also what you expected, but also what your familiarity is with how Ed and Sean work, their, their prior works. Uh, I, <clears throat> I guess I'll jump in first. Uh, I was talking about this with Kill beforehand. The only thing I've, I've ever read by Brubaker uh, is his Captain America stuff. Um, the which is the Bucky Cap Winter Soldier that I think is obviously pretty well known now um, mm -hmm. because I had a friend growing up who was like a huge Captain America fan and, and pushed me to check it out um, at the time when I was, you know, a teenager who only read Marvel books. Um, so that's really my only familiarity with the character and that's going back so – or with the character, with the writer. And that's, you know, going back so far now um, that it really – you know, it, it felt like a, a brand new thing. So I went in with, like, I guess high expectations just because I know that Ed Brubaker is supposed to be a great writer, and I know he's a writer that you hold in very high regard, Sean. Um, so I was excited to check this out, um, especially because, it had, you know, I think Will's recommended it to us like three or four times before we finally decided to go for it. So I was like, that's high praise, right? It's a book that's definitely got had a lot of love in the community. Um, so, yeah, I went in blind and was very excited. Awesome. How about you, Kale? Uh, yeah, similarly, I'd read the Captain America uh, run. I also, uh, I'm a big fan of his Batman stuff. He and Rucka did the Batman murder fugitive uh, storyline. And I think Brubaker did some more uh, in that, in that same vein, but uh, that's one of my favorite Batman uh, uh arcs 
Um, I also recently did the the fade out, and I think I've I think I've done bits of Fatal and maybe Velvet, but I'm not 100 percent sure on that. Mm. How about you, Phil? Well, I've read his Daredevil run. I've read his Captain America. I've read Gotham Central. That was really good. Oh, I've done that too. Yes, Gotham Central, of course. I haven't read any of his image or independent stuff, though. Uh, as for what I kind of was expecting, um, the answer is really nothing. Oftentimes when I go into a book for the book club, I, I, I genuinely try to have as, as, as blank of a slate as possible, if possible. Um, obviously when we did like Watchmen or Mouse, it's, it's really like uh, impossible to go into the blank slate for something like that. But for this, it, that was a little more, I think, achievable. And, uh, I honestly prefer it that way. Obviously I know Brubaker has, he's, he's got chops. Um, I, want to, I, I want to go in not even knowing what to expect. How about you, Marco? So... This was my second ever Brubaker Phillips book. I had only previously read The Fade Out. Um, at the time when The Fade Out was being published, I picked that up month to month. And I, you know that was when I had largely been picking up stuff from Image. So pretty much anything that came out was like I was devouring it. And the, the concept for The Fade Out fascinated me. Uh, the storytelling, like everything about it. And so when I had sort of fallen in love with that book and I heard that this team was going to join up again, you know, at that point I still didn't have the sort of context to, to even know that they had been working together for so many years. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, Oh, dope. This is awesome. Like they're, they're going to do like another, another thing. It's going to be published to image again. So I was super excited for, for this book and excited to, to be talking about it. Um, at, at that point, because I had only been picking up comics for like maybe two, three years. Uh, there was a part of me where I was like, wow, I discovered these guys. Nobody knows about <laughs> the fade out and killer be killed. That's so funny. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's uh, excited to talk about it. Awesome, man. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I it sounds like I've been connected to these creators the longest. I've been reading Brubaker since his Captain America run. And I sought out Criminal not too long after I, you know, found out about ed um so i've been on the run with them since that point uh killer be killed wasn't something that i stumbled upon so much as it was just the next book that they were working on sure. together for me uh and i was really attracted to the fact that they were going to be inserting themselves into that monthly grind because it was not something that they had done before mm -hmm. and although i love the fact that they keep themselves fresh one of the frustrating things about following them is that you only get so much in a given year. Mm. You know, mm. a story you like might come to an end really sort of quickly relative to how comics typically work. And then, you know, there's nothing for a year or so. And so you're just sitting there waiting. Um, yeah, and like, God forbid one of them doesn't connect with you, right? <laughs> then that's a pretty long wait for the next classic that you're going to devour. Right. And thankfully that hasn't happened for me yet. I love crime stories and they always deliver on that element. And then there's always, it's always crime plus um, this, I would say is probably crime plus kind of horror crime plus kind heavy of action. Real. Yeah. Kind of. So yeah, uh, it's, it's a mixing of a few different things, but I think uh, if you enjoy crime most especially or just good storytelling you'll find something for yourself in here because there are so many themes um Sean, when was the last yeah, time you read this book prior to now i hadn't read it since it came out okay oh, cool. it wasn't that long ago it, it ended in 2018 so i'm yeah. rereading it two years after which is not too not too long yeah, yeah. um we would shout it out for so the house uh, was... polls i think even yeah. Oh, yeah. One hundred percent. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. One hundred and ten percent. So this is actually probably one of the most recently wrapped books that we've ever read for the book club. Yeah. Sounds like it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, but let let's let's jump in. Let's talk about the book because there's a lot to talk about, and it's a heavy book. We, we talked about the fact that it's kind of like a superhero. Um, 
that it, it kind of is like a superhero book, but mm-hmm. it has so many themes that are baked in and layered into it that even though it's about this one character who takes on, you know, a different kind of a different identity, uh, wears a mask and goes out and deals out vigilante justice, it's not driven by the same kinds of things that traditional superhero stories are driven by. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have the same trappings that those types of stories are driven by, except where they're intentional. One of the things that Brubaker talks about, if you read the back matter of Killer Be Killed, is that when he initially kind of started to cook it up, one of the things that he wanted to do was to work in that monthly grind and kind of drop in um, superhero tropes that would be familiar to readers who didn't necessarily know what their work was like before. And you can see that sprinkled in. So let's dive into how this thing starts. It starts with our main character, Dylan, uh, essentially kind of feeling like, you know, life's not going his way. Life is kind of blah. Think about like Fight Club, how that starts. Think about stories that are similar to that where the main character feels disenfranchised. And he has an experience where... He's attempting to kill himself because life just sucks. His girlfriend, his ex-girlfriend, Kira, is dating his roommate, Mason, and that sucks. You know, there's a lot of things that just suck in his life. She's not his ex at that time. She is. They dated. They broke up. They remained friends. And Yeah. Yeah, a thousand percent. Uh, So, you know, life is just not really going his way. He's he's it's fine. He's uh, still in school at 28 years old, which, you know, no one wants to be. But he is. And he decides he's going to give up. Uh, by chance, he survives his suicide attempt and uh, bumps his head. And now he sees a demon. And that demon's telling him to kill. And he decides that instead of killing whoever, he's just going to kill people who really, really deserve it. Now, there's a lot packed into that. And I'm going to talk a little bit about those themes uh, because I feel like they're important to understanding this story. Dylan decides he's going to kill someone who really deserves it once a month in order to keep this demon at bay. He feels like he knows that the demon is serious because he gets extremely sick when that month clock is is, is coming up. He gets assaulted in the streets, nearly murdered, and he goes and feeds the demon because he feels like otherwise he'll just die, right? Now, what I'm curious about from you guys is the first thing we're introduced to is mental health, mental illness. Do you guys feel, did you feel at the start of the book, like we were just dealing with a guy who was mentally ill? He's on pills. We know that he meets up with his drug dealer, Rex. Is he just a guy on, on drugs who may be misdiagnosed or just mentally ill who's seeing this thing or did he bump his head? And because he bumped his head, he starts seeing this thing. Or is it real? Where were you at in your hmm. mind sort of throughout the process of reading the book? Um, what I thought was compelling about it was that it was up for debate in my mind. You know, is that I, I think it's clear that um, you know, you're supposed to feel on some level that his mental health is playing a role. But then obviously as you learn more about the demon and, you know, his – uh, father and like all these other connections to it like that kind of deepened the mystery for me so I always felt like I was leaning more towards it being a mental health thing but I never um I shouldn't say never but for much much of the story I didn't think it was out of the realm of possibility that it could be either way you know and the fact that I ebbed and flowed with that was compelling to me uh funnily enough I found I took it at face value until he started questioning it. Mm. Okay. I when when the book was initially sort of promoted, um, it had that because I, I was picking it up month to month. It it had been sort of touted as more supernatural and horror. So when when in reading it, that sort of painted my perspective a little bit. So I, I sort of took it as no, this is just like a super some kind of supernatural force that's playing on the fact that he does have some sort of mental illness is depressed and preying on that. And that Mm. you as the reader are sort of experiencing the fact that 
he's having doubts on its about its existence because in this world it might potentially exist but at the same time because he is mentally ill it might also just be something that he is experiencing essentially in his head i never treated it like it was real and even if it was a story and in the way the games it very well could be uh it was never a point is what i really was my kind of thing from the very beginning of the book, uh, I immediately kind of juxtaposed it with with kind of a Punisher story, right? And the difference here is Brubaker puts so much emphasis on grounding it because this feels really realistic to me, like at least in reading it. Like it felt grounded in some sense of reality. And what my feeling was either the demon is purely metaphor for the demons within all of us, you know, that, you know, uh, want us to do self-destructive things or, um, you know, it, 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 it was just, uh, I, I don't know. I, I just, it, 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 whether or not it was actually real, I don't think really mattered to the story. I think that's a good point. Um, I don't think that the demons, you know, whether it was real or not, was material to the overall yeah. narrative. I think it was. I think it was a really good device, and I think yeah. it was used effectively. Yeah. yeah, and I think adding the notion that. His dad used to, you know, have these drawings and that the demon was in them. And then, you know, his his dead um, half-brother was seeing a demon. <clears throat> I think all of that added to it. Uh, I personally never thought it was real. Uh, but I'm just really skeptical. I just never really bought into the reality of that thing. Um, but I loved the fact that it was something that was present and was playing on your mind throughout the throughout the read. And I yeah. think the I think Brubaker does a really great job of playing with your head all throughout the book. Mm. Because Dylan is an unreliable narrator. Mm -hmm. And he is that almost from the word go. You're never quite sure if what he sees is real or whether what he's telling you is what's happening now or later. Um or or, or even if it happened at all, there are several several things we see throughout the book that didn't actually happen. Um, and I really appreciated the way that he uses a trope that you don't see in comics that often. Unreliable narration is typically something you see in, in, in novels and in books mm. because it's harder to convey that in comics. But I think Brubaker and Phillips do a really great job of using that device, which is typically only reserved for novels, in a comic about whether or not a guy is seeing something that's not there, right? Yeah, and I think, like, comics being such a visual medium, um, that plays to that strength as well. Like, it, to your point, you don't really see that device very often, but I think th it, it, coupled with the device of the demon, like, makes for a very, very compelling narrative. Um, and I think... To, to Phil's point, like, it really, uh, it doesn't matter whether it's real or not because the drama that's created by either the presence of the demon or the hallucination of it is what is compelling, right? And, like, the fact that, um, to your point, Sean, that, like, Brubaker plays with us by having there be so many layers and having the relationship of the demon to Dylan's actions kind of ebb and flow because like there's a huge portion of the story where the demon's not a relevant factor for him for a while and he's not thinking about it and then when he stops thinking about it like you know eventually it comes back into play and like you the fact that you have like reasonable doubt at all no matter where you lie is is a really cool element and it's a thing that like ultimately doesn't it's not the core of the story but it, it's a really, really compelling, like, to borrow your word, Sean, device that's, like, 
played over and over again in different ways, but never to lessening uh, to a lessening degree of satisfaction. You know, like whenever the demon makes an appearance, it always matters and it's always interesting. You know, and uh, yeah, I think I think like the combination of that and Dylan's narration, like give the the story such a strong foundation because i think the actual unfolding of events is interesting enough that if those things weren't as good you could still probably read this book and think it was an interesting story but um on those devices alone and the the execution of them uh the book is really really strong i think on like a mechanical level hmm And that's something that uh, pleases me about reading books by Brubaker and Phillips is that regardless of what the content itself is, what the story they're trying to tell is, you can almost always, in my experience, you can always be sure that it will be solid mechanically. The parts will always work. You know, they're they're um, a well-oiled machine at this point. And, and that's something that I really appreciate. And I'm excited for people for whom they've not experienced them too much because you're not used to seeing two people who've worked together for 20 years do what they do. That's pretty unique in comics. And it's funny because it, it is really unique in comics. And I think it's kind of a shame because, like, when you t- – I didn't know that they had worked together so much until you literally told me earlier today, Sean. Um, and – I, I was like, that's like really cool because it's like they're like a they're like a band, you know, like they've like <laughs> played together enough. You know, they've worked together enough where like they must have like they've got the sound, you know, like they know how to communicate and how to like both do what lifting needs to be done. Um, and it, yeah, I mean, it, it's really impressive work for sure. There's a really strong synergy there that, that you that gets conveyed. And I think. In, in a lot of their books, you, you get to feel you feel that. Uh, I know I felt that way in like the fade out. There there are moments where in this in this book, you know, you can really tell that uh, Brubaker was trying to get a, a thought across, especially on some of those pages where it's just a long piece of text, but alongside it is just uh, maybe like a single panel or just the entirety of the page is you know a certain motion, and you can you can see that it fits well. It evokes something. Um, I, I did just want to go quickly back to what you mentioned, Sean, about the um, the unreliable narration. We, we, we um, had reviewed Fearscape by a friend of the show, mm-hmm. Rana Sullivan, and that also yeah. sort of had that trope of the difference there being um, Henry Henry is unreliable because of his ego and he's trying to sort of cover something up. But the mystery in Killer Be Killed here is sort of enhanced because – yeah, he is an un, he's unreliable and sort of sometimes has these fantasies, but because he himself doesn't know, he can't even necessarily sort of twist the narration in a way that might be positive for him. And so mm-hmm. those additional levels continue to sort of drive the confusion, drive the the um, the sense that you know what is what is real and what is not. That's a really interesting point. Um... I'm glad you brought up Fearscape because I I had the same thought while I was reading this about the unreliable narrator. And I think it's uh, like in that case, you're right. Like he's uh, the narrator is lying to us in that sense. But in this, like he can't lie to us because he himself isn't sure. Yeah. And that really does. it, it, It makes the whole thing a mystery, you know, even though it's not really like a mystery story. That's not really the point. Um, But there are so many mysteries to be unraveled within it, you know, about the truth of his past and how it all plays together, you know? Mm -hmm. One of the interesting things, I think, to kind of bolster but also counter what you guys are saying is that he does lie to us. Um, There are panels that, that we see where he's saying things that he didn't really say. And he... Yeah, that's true he you, that's kind of a meta con, uh, meta conversation about what comic book readers expect and what at, you know to a larger degree what people expect from their entertainment and again it's another way it's the third level if you will of the inception of how ed <laughs> brubaker is 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 sort of using the medium to mess with you yeah you know 
um, you expect that something is going to happen on the page. You expect that this character is going to use certain words or phrases, so he does. But not because that's what really happened, only because that's what you think you, you're supposed to see. And I really loved that. Not because it added to the larger narrative but because the more closely you're engaged with this the more you're going to get out of it and even if you're unaware it's still going to be playing in your subconscious of like wow you know what's going on here i'm not really clear on all this i i also think that those those moments helped for me a lot because i liked the narration a lot and i think the narration goes a long way in helping you get to know um dylan as a character you know and like i think the fact that like he lies to us in those moments and then immediately is like but i didn't really say that because i'm a coward or because you know or whatever you know like it it gives you a real insight into like who he is and how he sees himself in the world Yeah, um, and and again, it's just brilliant work, I feel, on the part of Brubaker to use this story that is, in a lot of ways, about, at least one part of it is about someone's mental health deteriorating, uh, to, to, to use that to go into, uh, you know, unreliable narration or all of that. It's just, I think it's just really brilliant. Um, go ahead. You know, early on, I found that all really frustrating, actually. Really? Uh, I did. Mm. And it, 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 I, I, I had a really interesting relationship to, in reading this. I, like, I really hated it at first. Like, the first maybe five mm. issues, I thought, I was like, I can't stand this. <laughs> but then, but then we had the single issue uh, with, um, with his partner. Kira. Kira, Kira, and her whole background, and I had a complete turn on it. But then, you know, maybe fifteen ish, like by issue fifteen, I'm thinking, like, you know, honestly, I think this book would be a lot better without any of the violence. If this book had none of that, I, and this was more of a study about this guy's mental health and how he's interacting with his relationships. Because I thought at, at that point, I was thinking, like, that's the real strength of this. Is like. Is, is is like the dialogue with the other characters because there's a lot of depth there and it was it wasn't until the last issue that i really came full circle i was like well no i think this i, I felt i felt the complete story at that point but in, in my reading experience i found that really really frustrating at first i think that's so I, interesting i i had something similar on my reread because i do remember that uh, month to month i was like really grasping at it and, and really you know hungry every time it would drop but rereading it i was annoyed that he teased that something else was going to happen down the road but he's just kind of like feeding us bits and pieces of it um not, not to the point that I, I i disliked it upon my my second read but just that i did find it as something that was frustrating because i i already kind of knew it was going to happen and i, I had sure. wanted that a little sooner um so but interesting interesting that interesting. that that was your your take uh I, phil I, I was very annoyed by narrative cliff uh narration based cliffhangers at first it wasn't until he uh started an issue and ended an issue talking about how he was gonna uh shoot up a warehouse that i i finally came around on it but it it, it was um it was like I said. It was kind of a roller coaster for me in terms of how I consumed it. That's funny. That the only real moment I had with, in regards to what you you and Marco were saying, was uh, uh, the moment where he he says, uh, "Oh, did you notice the the cab driver was Russian?" That's right. You won't remember. And then when it comes back around, I went. Oh, I did remember stupid. Yeah, I did that too. <laughs> <laughs> Although to be fair, like if I had been reading it month to month, Lord knows if I would have remembered. Oh, absolutely. Right? Yeah, like yeah, probably yeah. not. <laughs> but, <laughs> um I I like yeah. devoured this book too. Like I I really found it to be like a, a page turner. Um like and I found it really easy to like get through, you know? Like I think I read the entire thing in like two sittings. Yeah. And it's a lot. It's like twenty issues, so 
Um, they have long, long issues too. They're like thirty something uh, pages. Yeah. I think that the way, again, like the way the narration plays out, where he'll say something like, "Oh yeah, you'll probably forget that," is like a call out at yeah. the yeah. typical superhero month, superhero book monthly reader. The way that those books often get you is like, oh, we'll just insert this character right here, you know, and you'll forget who that is. And then when we reveal it later, it'll be this big pop. Or um, the fact that the Russians came back after several issues of not being a factor. That's a typical comic book trope of we're going to bring back a villain. You mm-hmm. know, recurring villains are a staple of, of superhero comics and not mm-hmm. so much outside of superhero comics. And, you know, Ed Baker used those as familiar tools for the uninitiated to be brought into this world. Um, But also similarly for those readers who don't want to read a book that doesn't feature violence, a lot of issues would start with that. A lot of issues would, would start with some kind of crazy action sequence that wasn't even happening in the moment. That was something that was going to happen later on that we would need to go ahead, Gail. Or the same action sequence over and over several times right sure. and and it's it's simply because in most I, th- I would imagine it's borderline a mandate that there's got to be some type of physical violence in every issue of a, you know a superhero comic i'm not saying i know yep. that but what you know it, it often feels like that sure. uh so yeah, phillips just didn't want to draw <laughs> He's like, but what I, I if did... we just keep going back to that one moment, though? <laughs> <laughs> I did want to talk about how it is that that a, that a guy like Dylan gets to the place where he's ready to just commit, you know, murder, uh, mass murder, borderline in several situations. Uh, and I think that there's a few ways that the book clues us in. Some of some of them are very direct, and some of them are not. So one of the ways that it's direct is in the society in the in the sense that society is screwed right and we Dylan, live in a society <laughs> well it's funny you say that i've been thinking about the movie joker a lot as i was yeah. reading this because joker is a movie about a guy who has some mental illness issues who is tired of the way that the world is and decides he's going to take matters into his own hands and killer be killed is very much the same thing Killer Be Killed probably handles it differently. Part of that is because it takes place over 20 issues and it's not a movie and blah, blah, blah. But they're about very similar things. Uh, Dylan is tired of the way that society is screwed. He has to get his medication from a drug dealer because he can't afford to go through the whole hoops that come with, you know, getting your medication normally. The expense you know, how hard it is sometimes to get in front of a doctor, various different things, right? Um, All those things really suck. The way that society looks down on somebody who is a learner, you know, someone who's trying to go to school that's not in their early 20s or late teens. He is an older, older, I'm his age, but like he's trying to go to school and he, you know, has this roommate who's kind of shit towards him in Mason. Um, and he clearly feels ashamed of the fact that he is older trying to, you know, graduate. Um, you know, the fact that people so often can get away with the things that they do. That's a recurring conversation in the book. One of the guys he kills is someone who he compares to the people who, you know, the Enron scandal and all of that and the big banks and everything else. Yeah. Um, he clearly has contempt. For that kind of a thing. And we're dealing with a guy who's tired of getting screwed over by society. Tired of being looked down upon. And he wants to do something about the things he sees in society that are horrible. Marco said earlier he could feel Brubaker speaking through Dylan. And I totally agree with that. That's something that's addressed in the back matter of some of the issues. Mm. Um, Yeah. I love books and movies where the character is someone who could really exist, especially when they're in a scenario like this. Joker is another example. Uh, I think Fight Club is another example where you're talking about a downtrodden guy who's tired of being beat down, 
who wants to do something about it. The powder keg in this particular book is the demon, but it could be anything, right? So this is something that I feel like some people might be mad at, and I'm really curious to hear what you guys have to say. Is it a problem for you that the catalyst of what sends him out on a murder spree seems to be a hallucination, a delusion, a product of mental illness? Is that something that you have an issue with? I I, I didn't see it as that because – and I, I specifically wanted to uh, – uh, there was, a, I think, an issue for it. He mentions how, like, the – there's a moment where a human is capable of something, and that capability yeah. is only a function of where you stand with a rule, right? Once that barrier is passed – you can look back on that barrier and you realize it wasn't a hurdle. And, and I think that that, that moment to me wasn't so much even like a rationalization or something put upon him by the demon. Uh, it was just within the situation. He, he realized that there was a line and if you stepped over it to hit to, to the point that he makes in the book, you don't get caught. The consequence is minimal to nothing the yeah the other the other justification he uses later on is uh what what one man can do so can another sure yes yeah i i didn't look at it as a mental illness at that time and and again yeah. i never i never saw the demon as a literal construct at this point in the story you know it feels like a it feels like a, a Holden Caulfield type thing where it's a young, angry guy where life isn't going his way. And I think that's where the parallel of Joker comes. And the demon to me felt like a manifestation of his rage. And he, this is the birth of a serial killer. And in his own mind, he's not a hero of his own story, but he's doing what he has to do and he justifies it when he when he kills his first victim who, which leads to the exposure of a, a, a child pornography ring and he says without me doing this um this evil would have remained sealed and covered up right and so to me that demon was just a it was a metaphor for for unleashing that rage, taking control of his own life, at, at least at the time where it's revealed, as the story unfolds more, my my perception of it changes a little bit. But you know, at the time, I I, I didn't really I didn't perceive it that way. Well, that takes us into the a conversation I feel like we have constantly on the book club, at least the ones I host about righteous killing. Uh, he is another righteous killer, the same way the, the X-Force were that, the same way we talked about that with the Illuminati um, during Jonathan Hickman's run on Avengers. Mm. And in, in a lot of ways, Dylan is sort of saying, whether it's, whether it's spurred on by uh, mental illness or whatever, that he's tired of the way the world is and he's going to do his part to set it right by killing people who deserve to die, right? Right. One of my favorite parts of this entire book is the conversation that he has with Detective Sharp, oh. where she's like, no, you. why do you get to be the judge, jury, and executioner because you decide who's good and bad? Mm. And he's like, well, no, I didn't decide who was good or bad. We already know who's good or bad. We just don't want to do anything about it, but I'm willing to. So do you guys take his side on this? Do you see his his point of view when they have this really interesting conversation where he's sober and he's able to speak his mind? Or do you feel like people like him, people like Punisher, people like, you know, whoever are bad even if what they are, even if they think what they're doing is justifiable? I think That's um oh, go ahead, Marco. Sorry, that th that was the exact conversation I was going to bring up because he lays it out. He's like, we we can tell inherently 
good from bad we we grew up with the 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 stories with you know the 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 lessons there and i think it's i think it's twofold i think yes we can distinguish it and no he is not right for killing those people but he is right for killing those people in that murder is inherently bad but the aspect that is murdering righteously is good in a larger sense but both can both truths can be held in that scenario i i don't think that mm. there's a dichotomy or that there's one or the other you can't just be good or just be bad you can be doing a good thing while committing a wrong action sure. and i think that I, I feel like i've i've stated this many many a time but like i'm 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 namor bro it's like blow that up son <laughs> can i that can, that sounds like a turn <laughs> yeah <laughs> can, can i just challenge that thought to add to the discourse because the same logic that you just applied to dylan's behavior can be applied to the behavior of the people he's killing uh in the very conversation we're discussing now lily says well they all had families and that's true and to those families right those people that he killed were probably good people. Those people were probably a dad or a brother or a son. And not the not the brother that was a uh, uh, preyed on his uh, on his younger brother. Absolutely. Well, he w- well he was also those things though to right. to the rest of the people in his life. But but that's what I'm saying by there is you can exist in that dichotomy. You, you can exist in in that space occupying those those two dis, uh, distinct ideas that you can be doing something good by doing something that is wrong and that not not cancels out but doesn't like yes he's murdering somebody who is a father who might be a brother who might be whatever or who is a brother but you can see that yes the that evil there is something that you can get rid of and maybe save more more than the one person hmm. that more, more than the one person um and obviously that comes like it's like the valuation but sure. um yeah so uh, sean i think um we we talked about this you you brought up that we've talked about this on past book clubs and it, it reminds me of the conversation we had around x-force where uh i think it's i echo some of the ideas i I shared there where I, I think it's about the fact that like actions are not wholly good or bad, right? That like most actions are gray. Um, and I think that uh, I, so it's interesting cause I wanted to bring back, back up the point that Phil made about earlier thinking that the, the violence felt superfluous in, in the moment. And that's something that I, I think um, it, it's so important because it raises this question. Right, and it makes you have to ask that question of like, is there is there uh, any good in what he's doing? And I think you, I, I'm I'm not gonna sit here and justify murder, right? Because that's the at the end of the day, he is a serial killer. The fact that he chose to kill people who are bad doesn't make his actions good, right? But I also think that I agree with the sentiment he himself puts out as the narrator, which is that it's hard to feel bad about him murdering a pedophile. You know, it's hard for it's hard to feel bad uh, about you know um, him killing uh, a guy who's involved in in you know like what seems to amount to sex trafficking, right? Like at the end of the day, like those are those are bad people, and no amount of them being a husband or or brother or whoever or whatever right like at some point like there's too much red in your ledger right like you've done enough bad that the reality is that if you're dead less people suffer so i think you can argue that sure like the the byproduct of his action may be positive but i don't think that that uh makes him like a righteous um i don't think that makes his killings righteous whether or not you want to argue that he's a righteous killer does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. I think that that is uh, – it's a very compelling conversation. It's obviously a conversation that 
the the creators want us to be having. Um, and the fact that Dylan is able to do this might strike some people as veering too far into unreality or, you know, oh, there's no way someone could get away with this. But I feel like the book does a pretty good job of explaining the ways in which and the reasons why he's able to get away with this. One of the things that I think is is sort of under the radar, but really stuck out to me, especially the second time around, is how many times they show Dylan in a crowd. And I think that for me, that served two purposes. So one is to show the loneliness that he probably feels. Yeah. The larger than lifeness of the world, which makes him feel small. To a lot of people, it doesn't make them feel anything. But for him, it makes him feel small. But then on the other side of that is the anonymity that it provides. He doesn't live in a small town. He's, he's not just one of 100 people who live in a specific area. He's one of millions of people that live in New York. And he is a white guy of, you know, a young age. And there's a lot of people like that. So, you know, they make the point to show you how even the gun he's using, that, that, that there's tons of that gun and tons of those bullets in circulation, that it's hard to, to catch someone like this. We've had serial killers in real life, you know, who've gotten away with several murders before they were caught. And you can see here that it's really nothing more than Dylan's own hubris and a little bit of bad luck that gets him uh, caught ultimately. Yeah. I, I never felt like it was unbelievable that he was getting away with it. Cause like, I think especially like um, the, it's funny because like you said, when he switches over to the, the shotgun, like then it becomes like, you know, it's a, it's a, needle in a haystack of how many weapons are like that it's like that original pistol that ends up like kind of giving them up yeah because it was like a 38 special which was interesting but i liked that i love the point about how think of how many unregistered guns there are that were bought 50 60 years ago and are sitting in a garage somewhere or whatever in an attic in this case and the idea that he did that and put it back could have put it back and gotten away with it I think that's totally plausible. And I know that, like, in the current era of, like, DNA and all that kind of stuff, like, it seems um, implausible. But, like, people get shot in cities and all the time and no one ever figures out who does it. Like, it's not, you know, it, it, like, if he hadn't gone to the point of, like, I'm going to shoot a guy in a bathroom in the middle of the day, you know, downtown or whatever, like, yeah, he probably could have went on doing it for a long time before – somebody actually would have been able to connect the dots, let alone if they care to, right? Because that was a huge part of why he was getting away with it too, was that people didn't really give a shit and didn't believe that there was anything to it. Yeah, you, think... you turn on you turn on the news at like nine, police are searching for this individual or whatever, you know, like that's, they, 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 living in New York City, that's just what you see. You know, it, it's hard. In any city. The, the difference, and I think what makes it, to me feel believable is why I don't feel sympathy for him in this story. Is he killing bad people? Yeah, obviously, but there comes a point when, when I, I do, I, and to his own point, when you know, right versus wrong, like just you're raised with it. There comes a point where it becomes just abundantly clear that he's a serial killer. And, mm-hmm. you know, you look at him like a serial killer. Like, I, I'm skeeved out by him. Yes. He becomes just as bad as what he's doing. Now, granted, he's not he's not operating a sex trafficking ring. He's not, he's doling out, you know, some kind of blind injustice here, right? But he is judge, jury, and executioner. And I think we fundamentally know when someone just takes a unilateral um, amount of power like that, 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 that's, that's not really a good thing. And, and um, anytime you listen to a story about a serial killer, and there's any number of shows and podcasts out there about them, you know, you're not meant to relate to them or sympathize with them. And there's aspects of their lives will sympathize with like there's points where he's laying with Kira and he talks about feeling alone and he talks about 
stuff with his dad like there are things that are universal about him and his trauma or whatever but that's not the point the point is like at the end of the day the parts of him that are sympathetic left the station when he decided to like mow down like what nine ten people and like when you read a punisher story that feels like a comic book most of the time not with every author here like it feels like brubaker's writing a real person that's taking justice into his own hands I I would push back on that just because we we look at our soldiers as heroes, right? And and they are people who are legally licensed to go and kill the quote unquote enemy, right? The the I, I was listening to some podcast and I, I forgot what it was, but somebody no um uh tune in. Oh, weird! I was every, listening this week <laughs> every Monday, um but. Uh, he had come back from Vietnam and he was obviously, he, he was, you know, shell shocked. He had PTSD, but, but he, he made a point where like the, the difference in Vietnam versus here is that legally I'm allowed to do it there. And I'm allowed to put a stop to the quote unquote violence and evils that we see f- in, in, in a foreign sense, but can't do so domestically because of some of the laws that are imposed here. So I don't, that's a fair thing to point out that that was, that was a whole societal conflict in this country after the Vietnam war, because it's like, what the fuck is, are we doing? Like you look at someone like uh, the sniper, Chris Kyle, who's an extremely device divisive figure who killed a lot of people. Like the, the, the the aspect of war of killing people that's that's a really that's a complicated conversation but like even then when when people kill a lot of people you know there are a lot of people who don't look at that as heroic but but my my point being there is when you view dylan versus let's say a vet do you view them as inherently uh as an inherently like quote unquote wrong or or evil person or is it relative to you because that i think is the is is the distinguishing factor i think i think you're painting with too broad a brush when you make that comparison um because i don't think that like not every vet you know like um has the same level of like culpability and like the kinds of killings that you're talking about right so like you know, like I well, think, I, but 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 I mean, Phil Phil made made the point of it being specifically someone who kills um, a large amount of people, right? And so, I, I'm just saying, I, but I'm just saying, like it, it, in in that scenario, a vet who has five plus kills, right? So I, okay. you're 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 arguing, right? Like I, I guess asking the question, right? Like is is there a difference between murder and like killing someone, right? And like I know in, in the way you view somebody, yeah, but I think it does, right? Because like I think I I think when you contextualize dylan's killings and why he's doing them and what he's getting out of them i agree with phil like it's clear that he's a serial killer like he's getting emotional and and like in some cases like leading to sexual gratification out of the fact that like he he feels powerful as a killer and i think if you're a soldier and the reason you went to war is because you feel like a big man when you pull the trigger and kill somebody, then yeah, I would look at you as a fucking murderer in the same way that I think that he's a fucking murderer. Um, and, and I think, you know, I think like, I think that's a valid point to bring up, but I, I think, um, yeah, like it's, it's fucking murky for sure. Like, but I I think like, and, in a war, it's it's complicated because you know you're following orders, right? That's the whole thing. Um, uh, you can argue the culpability and how complicit you are in the taking of other lives, but uh, at the end of the day, you're being you're being ordered to by a, a much bigger, you know, by your entity, country. and and. That's really complicated. And there's a lot to unpack there, but to Pete's point, it's the type of person who relishes in in in, in taking life. There's there's there, that's I think the distinction. Well, I, I want to add a little bit of uh, additional, uh, like another side to this, because at the same time, people in war kill anonymous people. 
They don't kill people that they know of. And I think you can look at that either way. Mm. Uh, on one hand, you could say, well, the fact that you're willing to kill someone you don't even know, that you don't even care about who they are to others, you don't know what they've done wrong other than the fact that they're on the other side of this particular political yeah. issue that your country has with another is worse than More going out and killing targeted people that you know are bad. Mm. But at the same time, you could say, well, this is premeditated. You're going out of your way to find a reason to kill someone, not because they're bad, but because you need to kill. Because you so want now to you're, kill. Yeah, you're, you're justifying your need to murder by murdering good people or bad people. It's like Dexter, the TV show. For those yes. It's just like Dexter. Yeah. So I see it both ways. I think it, I think it can be seen both ways. Um, and I think that that, again, is what makes the book so interesting. However, I think Ed Brubaker has something to say about this. Um, so later on in the story, we learn that there is a second killer, right? Um, this is obviously jumping way ahead, but it's fine. Uh, Dylan ends up in a mental hospital, and we learn that there's someone out there, another vigilante who's killing people, uh, donning the, the visage. Setup. Yeah. Of, of the vigilante, which of course again is a reference to comics in a meta context because it's it's the it's the someone taking on the mantle. Right. So that guy though is a racist. He is xenophobic, and he's killing black drug dealers who are selling weed and and coke. He was a vet, low right? level offender. He was also. He was also a vet, but I didn't want to color it with that because that could mean a lot of things. Sure. Um, so, but this guy has decided to take matters into his own hands and become judge, jury, and executioner as well. Mm -hmm. So in my opinion, what I got out of that was, well, Dylan just so happens to have the wherewithal to target people who are bad. But this guy doesn't. He thinks he is, though. He, but he exactly. But he thinks he is. So the difference in this case is the perspective of the individual who is viewing the actions. Not everybody is as soft on selling coke and weed as the five people on this podcast. So he, they might see that as reasonable murders, sure. just as reasonable as the murders that Dylan is committing. And he's, he's motivated by Dylan and, and Dylan's manifesto he wrote in the newspaper. Mm -hmm. Exactly. He, he misconstrues Dylan, it in his own way. Right. If we're if we were to agree that Dylan is doing the right thing, we would have to at some point concede that he's doing the wrong thing because it's inspiring people to do the wrong thing. Right. So, yeah, it's, it's very interesting. And I, again, I love that Brubaker uh, put all of this nuance into this story i got so so pissed off sean in issue 20 and like he fucking pulled the narrative skirt out from under us and it's like yeah i'm friends with the cop now and she's like yeah go kill this guy and i'm oh a superhero vigilante now and i'm thinking like this shit fucking sucks i know the roof is just like oh and he's like got a better costume and stuff and then like no i'm actually dead but it's just like he oh, got me that time. I was so mad. It was not not at the. I was relieved that like that's not what happened. Yeah, like right. in the moment, I was like, "What are you trying to say, Brew Baker?" I, I do. I was so pissed off. I, I remember literally just. I was like, "Oh, I was like, are you fucking kidding me?" I was like, "Don't. You're gonna ruin the whole." I was like, "Okay, all right, all right. Good, good, good gag." <laughs> I, I have a lot to say about that. Um, but I'm going to pull a Dylan. And I'm going nice. to take us all the way back. That's because... right, you will remember. <laughs> Let's go all the way back to the beginning and talk about issue one again. <laughs> Let me wait for this siren to pass. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Because one of the reasons why Dylan ultimately does get in trouble is the manifesto that he writes. And the reason he writes it is because he wants to take himself off the map because he's worried about the rest of the people in his life. So I want to talk about some of the rest of the people in his life. So Kira is, as we mentioned uh, earlier, his ex-girlfriend, who's now his best friend, who's dating 
his roommate, who was Mason, who was a younger college student who uh, kind of like looks down on Dylan and, you know, subtly rubs it in his face that he's dating his ex and all that kind of jazz. Fake what did you think about? Sorry. He's a fake friend. Yeah, he was a fake friend. What did you guys feel about the relationship that Dylan and Kira had and Kira herself as a character? She became a really fully fleshed out character in the aforementioned solo issue, I thought. And that's yeah. that that again was where I I, I I that was when I turned on the series in a positive way. And I felt I felt um I felt the relationship was really, really believable. Yeah. And my my feeling about the book as a whole kind of comes down to it, it I feel like it really it really catches like early twenties angst in a lot of ways. I know, I know Dylan's 28, but it's like the angst of being 2022 20, where Sean, you talk about this book being a story about finding yourself. And that's like the whole experience of being that age. Like Kira herself has a complicated relationship with her mother. And she says with regard to Mason, I feel like this is the man I see myself with. Like this is who I should be with as like a complete person. Uh, but I can only be myself with you, Dylan. And that, that speaks to that complication yeah. of early 20s type relationship of just like like dating in trying to find yourself through other people. And, and the, thing, the thing that sells that and that, that Brubaker nails in his writing is that she said, and that scares me. <laughs> <laughs> um. And, and and it was part of like the Holden Caulfield effect of that beginning part with with Dylan, where he's like uh, everything's fucked up, and I you know, I'm depressed and all this stuff. World's um, full of a bunch of phonies. He, yeah, exactly. Uh, um, he really encapsulates like that feeling of development before you are like a, a, a whole person, and. To, to Brubaker's credit, he really takes you on that journey. When Kira and, and Dylan are actually like dating in the middle, the second half of the story, they feel like an adult couple, hmm. complete with the lies that Dylan is holding back. I like Daisy. Daisy. Talk about it. Um, I thought that that was like just a cool sort of rekindling. I didn't the the whole reason why they broke up. I didn't find believable. The, oh she stole my art and like that made me upset and like don't put it up even though I said it like what? that's a conversation to have dude no I, I know, know people a reason have but done that. I know people have actually broken up for that kind of reason I, first of all I think that's a totally legitimate reason to break up with yeah. somebody uh, <laughs> first of all uh, that being said like Sean said that wasn't even the real reason it was just kind of an excuse <laughs> yeah that too well at any rate um yeah no but I, Kara was a good character like she she to, to what Phil said, I think the issue seven fleshed her out to make her more than just like, you know, the the Beloved the person who both other guys exactly yeah. yeah. So I, I think that gave her depth as a character. It made the relationship make more sense. It gave it more context as to like why her and Dylan sort of fit together and, and are so comfortable around each other. And um, yeah, like she was she was a really strong character. Yeah, I I think she's pretty important to the story. I, like, she's really the only other like really serious like actor, you know. Um, like her kind of. Um, I, I and I liked her on top of that, but I mean, I think like her whole kind of discovery of of the medication angle or whatever, like, really is a pretty important wrinkle in the story, you know. Um, oh, dude. I I was so bad for her when she had to listen to Dylan fuck Daisy. Yeah, that was like so, <laughs> so like, rough. Yeah, rough is, is the right word for it. Uh, and, and I I think in general, I I really like uh, the fact that he has a relationship with both her and Daisy because I think the fact that um, the 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 duality of his like of his lives and like who he is around other people versus who he is when he's, you know, I guess really himself, right? Um, I think definitely deepens my kind of um, 
distaste for him, you know, because I think like that's one of the the things that um that really drives home I think kind of the idea that he is like really pretty unwell, you know, right? That like he can go and do these things and then like lie to literally every person in his life and maintain this facade and like yeah it weighs on him a little bit but like he doesn't crack you know like he, he like I, I can't imagine you know he kind of does he kind of does he well he literally does uh that's... he was interrupted <laughs> by mason but he was telling kira that he was telling her that oh she, that's, that's true yeah i forgot about her. that shit yeah yeah he also deliberately avoids her especially earlier on because he can't handle being around her and having this secret. Right. Um, Kale, did you, you didn't speak on her, did you? Well, she was fine. I, oh yeah, my God. I, I like her. No, I, no, Good. I don't oh, have a problem with great, it. Right? Great podcasting dog. <laughs> what do you want to say? <laughs> oh, I like the way the color of her hair changed with the narrative <laughs> themes of the, of the book. And, that would be interesting. Oh, I, you know, I wish, I wish that she uh, been uh, more explored through the color of her hair and the relationship with her mother and and you know I really <laughs> thought it was important when she when she took that that drink of coffee in that coffee shop I really thought that that really cemented their relationship is that what you want Phil <laughs> no but that was really good I liked it a lot <laughs> Um, right. I did have a question about uh, her finding the pills uh, that whole thing was kind of confusing to me so. You you said earlier that Dylan's medication was the stuff that was being provided by Rex, right? Yes. Yeah. So what she found was it was that it wasn't the correct medication. Right. Right. It wasn't what he thought it was. Yeah. It wasn't what Dylan thought it was. Right. Or right. Rex. Well, it may have been what Rex thought it was. We don't know. I guess that's true. But okay. I, I thought the implication was that when she took it to the doctor, it was like it was not the pills that were like, uh, well, I guess that to your point. Exactly. That doesn't, yeah. Fair enough. OK. So, yeah, um, he'd been for a long time taking uh, an antidepressant and or anxiety med, but not anything that was an antipsychotic. Right. OK. I really, really liked Kira. And I'm going to get into you know, Kale was just making fun of like a, the 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 you know the metatextual analysis and all that kind of jazz. But um, I, I actually had some deep deeper thoughts about Kira. I want to point out an Easter egg, though, at least something that I felt was an Easter egg. When she's talking to her therapist, the room she's in is the same room that Tony Soprano sees his therapist in on The Sopranos. Ha, what? <laughs> I can see that. That's cool. Uh, I can see that. And in the back matter, Ed Brubaker actually says that he's been rewatching Sopranos throughout the the you know the telling of this tale that's cool um that being said i think that kira is important because kira represents a, a character who's dealing with her problems in a way that is healthy whereas mm -hmm. dylan is not mm -hmm. so she is seeing a therapist dylan is not dylan stopped going to whatever therapist he was seeing up in uh, westchester yeah um, yeah yeah, newer show, and you know he's kind of avoiding all that stuff. She wants to talk to Dylan about what's going on with their relationship. Uh, he doesn't want to talk about the fact that he's uncomfortable with how often she's around with Mason and how that makes him feel. Yeah. He shoves his emotions down all the time, and she doesn't do that. She's very forward facing. She's a very clear actor. She's taking hold of her life. Um, and because of that, even though she has a similar sadness that Dylan has, she's experienced some rough stuff. She's full of life and he's not, you constantly see them out on dates together. There's a moment later on where it's snowing and she has her tongue out and she's trying to catch the snow on her tongue, which is a very youthful thing to do, but it's also a very like normal thing to do and he's just there with a sourpuss that's in the entire book yeah he, kind of, he kind of just floats through life you know right and the only moments in his life where he's living passionately are the moments where he's out on the hunt on the prowl to mm -hmm. kill yeah and 
I think Kira representing that opposite end is really important to show us what's wrong with Dylan outside of what he's doing, just who he is as a person, what's fundamentally not working. Yeah. Yeah, he's he's broken um, inside. Yeah. But again, Kira isn't satisfied with being sad about the fact that uh, Dylan and her aren't working out. She goes to his house to say, hey, I still love you. And, you know, he's there with another person, which is sad, but she took the shot. And that's something that he's never, ever willing to do. Yeah, right. Like he couldn't even express his feelings, you know, right? Like when you think about their relationship, like she's the actor the entire time. Like she's the one who kisses him first, like and initiates their relationship. And she's the one who like breaks things off and then goes to reignite. Like he he doesn't uh, to your point, he doesn't really ever make any decisions that aren't related to killing someone. And I yeah, think the, the <laughs> <laughs> and and I think the the to what you said, Sean, the counterfactual there would be like it, it had she been somebody who also wasn't dealing well with this, like where would the narrative like where would that story have gone, you know? Hmm. Well, and I, I think it's good because it's it's great to have a juxtaposition, right? Because like something that I uh, experienced was like I was like you know reading a little bit about kind of like the discourse around the book and like seeing how many people. Um, I think pretty predictably, like, glorify Dylan and, like, say nasty things about Kira, right? Because it's like, oh, yeah, like, cheating on your, your boyfriend is totally the same as murdering 10 people, right? Like, those are totally analogous things, right? Like, that's, <laughs> that's the shitty thing that she does to deal with her trauma. He goes and kills a bunch of people, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, I think to Sean's point, like, she exists to, like, have a, a point to compare him against of, like, how fucked up he is. You know, compared to, like, she's dealt with the same level, if not, you know, worse in some cases. Um, but, yeah, he's just not, you know, he's not he's not willing or able to, like, accept help. You know, like, his mother offers to pay for him to go back to the psychiatrist, right? Like, she tries to get him to, you know, talk to a therapist and, like, try to do something about his mental health again like he's committed to, to the spiral dude the only thing those people online find unrelatable about dylan is the fact that he got laid regularly <laughs> yeah got him funny it's pretty good <laughs> that was good i liked it they suck <laughs> so i made that joke about i made that joke about kira's hair and i think there is something to it <laughs> <laughs> give it get it hit it what is it so the only time we ever the only time we ever see Kira Kira's hair as blue is when something real is happening. So in issue seven, when she's uh, uh, dealing with uh, her family junk, mm -hmm. and then when she con confronts Dylan about his uh, about his drugs, and then at the end. Uh, when it's uh, after the uh, after after he's dead, and we're you know in we're outside of his his uh, narrative purview, I guess. Oh hmm. yeah, interesting. Um, I I was wondering if that had anything to do with like. Like, is that the passage of time? Like, does issue seven take place after the events of the I, I sort of, I sort of thought that too, uh, and I think I think it could it could very simply be something like that. But I also sort of think it might be something like uh, it. It sort of goes with the idea that Dylan sees her a certain way. I, oh, I could see that. Yeah, it's I I I mean I, I I felt throughout the book that her hair was blue simply when she wasn't happy. Uh, that could be. Yeah, you know, her hair her hair is red when she's trying to reconcile with Dylan and when they get back together and go to the party and all that jazz switches back to blue 
when he's in the um, uh, mental institution, I believe. So, you know, there's there's definitely something to that. I did Come check on. that. It was it was red when he is in the institution. Oh, okay. You come home from a long day's work and Kira's hair is blue and you're like, oh, Kira, what's wrong? <laughs> <laughs> you come home and it's it's like it's like green. It's like, Kira, I don't know what this one means. So I wanted to take it back real quick with Kira and then move on. But um, she is still dealing with the trauma that she's had to live with her whole life in the sense that her mother is still alive. Um, and her mother was the person who kind of gifted her with this pain. Uh, whereas Dylan's father is the person who he kind of, his father was a, a good dude, but his, but he had a lot of feelings about his father and the fact that his father committed suicide and everything else. Um, and that's something that he's living with, even though his dad is dead. But Dylan's mother is alive and she's good to him. And he can't use the fact that his mother is alive as a way to heal. He can only push her aside, tell her, you know, oh, I don't need your help, blah, blah, blah. He won't even need dinner with her. Right. Kira's mother, who is the person who she has the animosity towards, is the one that's still alive, who she actively is dealing with. Uh, and I thought that that was just, that that was interesting because again, a lot of us have people in our lives who uh, we don't necessarily love dealing with typically their family, uh, but we do it, you know, because we have to or whatever. And she's just very accepting of life as it is and is willing to confront it. I get it, Sean. I can read between the lines. You don't love dealing with certain people in your lives. I, I got you. Well, you're <laughs> right about that. I, Four of them uh, doing a podcast right now. <laughs> I, uh, I I I think it's also I got kind of um, I don't know like a little bit like uh, Freudian with it too, where like I feel like there's the whole element of it where like sure like both of your parents are very important figures in your life, but I think a lot of times right like um, there's a strong connection to like your mother or your father, you know, in in, in a certain way. And I think, like, the fact that, like, Dylan is is mentally ill and, you know, uh, has this very, very, you know, uh, such a brief glimpse of even an idea of, like, who his father is, you know, and, and, like, what his relationship to him is. But, like, he's still such a major figure in his life and, you know the the shadow that i think it kind of cast over him when when he did oh, kill like himself a demon sure yeah i mean right maybe that's maybe there's something to that um versus kira where like you can see that like she's just as influenced by her mother but in different ways like i i feel like a lot like obviously you said she's the source of her trauma and like she learned certain coping mechanisms coping mechanisms and things from her but like i feel like she is like trying to get further from her mother and like create distance between her so that she can heal whereas like we see dylan like trying to cling to the scraps of what he knows about his dad and and make that mean something about him too i see yeah i i actually feel like if he had allowed himself to do that through therapy the way that Kira does, mm -hmm. he would have actually been able to find some healing because it's it's good that he was addressing his feelings about his father because his father's feelings, his father's suicide is directly connected to where Dylan is at in his life. Yeah. So not not dealing with that is a part of why he's stuck. But then when he decides he's going to deal with it, instead of leaning in, he starts killing people. He ran so far away from it that he starts murdering. His father was a drinker. <laughs> and, and to that, I mean, the first person that he tried to kill was himself, right? Like mm, twice. Just, totally. Yeah. Mm. I love that point. That's a really good point. Um, let's 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 talk about Rex. 
because I I feel like Rex is a is a pretty important character to the story, even he's the though plug, he's, bro. He's just the plug. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody needs to connect. I mean, you need something. You're, yeah, you're boys with that guy, and like, I, I felt that. Marco, are you number sixty nine to him? Nice, oh, nice. Number sixty nine. Number six six. Oh, Rex <laughs> is Dylan's Gwen Stacy in the sense hmm. that. Rex, they so, a lot. So, they, <laughs> in that Gwen Stacy is Peter Parker's opioid. <laughs> wow, some galaxy brain shit. <laughs> Peter Parker learns how dangerous his superheroics can be mm. to his friends and family through Gwen's death, and Dylan learns the same lesson. Not through, not just through Rex's death, but through the fact that he himself killed Rex. Yeah, accidentally or otherwise. I and loved that. Go ahead. I was gonna say I I loved it, and the thing that I thought made it really interesting too is that he doesn't really give it as much thought when he shoots that, you know, the the dancer to get her, get her off of him. Right, like he doesn't really like dwell on that at all but like when he kills rex that's the first time he's really forced to grapple with the weight of like what he actually is doing because again rex rex is not the dancer was some anonymous person rex is someone who he's known for years presumably who sells him drugs who isn't just a drug dealer someone he considers a friend on some level uh and now he has the weight of the fact that this guy's life is over because of what Dylan is doing. And again, you know, we had the morality conversation earlier and whether or not righteous murder is a thing. Well, look at the product, look at the result of what Dylan's behavior um, has led to. Now, Rex is dead. I think, I don't, I don't remember exactly. I think Rex had a family. I think that was something that was said. He had a wife. Yeah, he did. That now he's gone from their lives. So Dylan is now perpetuating the same type of problem. So, like, his problems have to do with his father not being in his life and his father's sadness. How sad do you think Rex's wife is going to be? How sad do you think that her daughter, that Rex's daughter is going to be now that their father is gone? Dylan caused that Mm -hmm. in every way. There's no way you look at it and say, well, Dylan didn't isn't responsible. Name, are we going to say something there? Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> Tell me how that's a justifiable <laughs> loss. And, 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 it's, it's, and it's interesting how we sure. mentioned earlier, like the copycat was killing drug dealers, and like that's where he sort of draws his sort of ethical line. Um, and then just to what Pete said uh, about the when he shot the the the, the sex the dancer. That was the one. That was the one shot. Where I was like, "Yo, what the fuck? That's it's not cool." Yeah, and he he dwells on it for all of one second, where he's like, "Oh my god, what if she dies?" Then he's like, "Well, okay, I guess I won't ever think about that again." <laughs> <laughs> Tip the demon off my back for a month, I guess. Yeah. But but yeah. So and then the other element with Rex is, that that I thought was interesting is that he's definitely. He, he's a vehicle for Brubaker slash Dylan to talk about the failure of the medical industry. Uh, yeah. The fact that, I mean, look, we all have agency, but Dylan fell through the cracks in the sense that he clearly needs help, decides he's going to stop going, and that's the end of that story. You know, that's the end of the story of his um, bettering himself. And it, it, it forces a question of, is it a communal responsibility to ensure the mental health of everybody around. So like what was the responsibility of Dylan's doctor to make sure that he was getting his medicine and that he was doing the right things? We see the doctor later and he says that he was going to do it at that point, but that's not what he was doing before. The the distinction I think is that's clear to me at least is uh, availability and access 
it's not the doctor's responsibility per se to tell Dylan. Well, he can tell Dylan what to do, but Dylan has to reject that, right? That's 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 the nature of having freedom of choice, right? But the problem, of course, is that Dylan doesn't have those resources because he can't afford it. He's in school. He's a, he's 28 years old. You know, he, he doesn't have the luxury of being able to choose those things. And presumably, it's mentioned that he did, he had a previous episode, like a breakdown. And it, it could be that, you know, he was on the track to, to be better, that maybe he just sort of went off them naturally. Um, well, and I think but to, to, we don't necessarily know like where, where that sort of stands to that point too, mm-hmm. right? Like he, he, his life is derailed by that event too. And I think that speaks to the, the brokenness of the system, right? That Sean has brought up a couple times how it's like, he is viewed as abnormal because he's approaching 30 and in school or whatever. And the expectation in our system is that at this point he has a salaried position that will help him get healthcare. And the fact that he doesn't have that leads to him having a second mental breakdown where a bunch of people end up dead. Yeah, I mean, was it like forty over forty million people in the United States don't have health care, and then I think it's like another thirty million to have inadequate health care. Um, like that—that's definitely the sympathetic aspect, and that's something that was uh, on in the Joker movie, like right people don't aren't able to receive the help that they need because it isn't there and so he self-medicates he we see him take you know he takes some weed uh and he you know is buying drugs from you know essentially a a third party he's buying drugs from a, a a mobile drug dealer you know um which it's again something that you will do in your twenties. Probably you will probably develop a coping mechanism for the way that the world is or the way that your personal life is through drugs. That's a, a very common thing, whether they be prescription <laughs> drugs or whether they be. Look at Marco. Marco, Marco looks side eyes the camera as he drinks. <laughs> hey, for those of you just, watching on YouTube, you I don't know that. what you guys are talking about. Audio Marco listeners, you don't have to that. transition. But. <laughs> But it is it is a real thing, and in this case, we don't know the full extent to which Rex didn't care about what he was giving Dylan. Uh, we know it wasn't what Dylan thought it was. We know it was a low dose of value when it was supposed to be something else. Yeah. We don't know if that was what Rex was doing on purpose. We don't know if Rex wasn't aware of that. But either way, because well, he went outside the system – go ahead. Think, think of what the demon said to him. It was like, why do you feel pity for this man? He's been pulling drugs on kids for years. Right. Yeah. I, of I course, know. he rejects that. He's like, that's not what happened. But it, it is, that is a possibility. Yeah, it's definitely a possibility. I, I kind of didn't feel that way considering like when he asks him for harder drugs, he's like, he turns him down, you know? Um, so like I kind of got the impression that like he was on the up and up. But yeah, to your point. We don't know. He also may just not have wanted to, to mess him up. Yeah. He was giving him a low dose of Valium, and clearly Dylan thought he was taking what he thought he was taking, and we don't know the degree to which psychosomatic feelings were at play. Um, and we don't know that if he wasn't taking the proper medication that he never would have seen the demon in the first place. So in that regard, I, I really didn't love Rex. Because I feel like, at the very least, he was not, he was negligent. He wasn't doing his due diligence, yeah. (laughs) Right. Uh, So that's pretty screwed up. But again, he does play an important role in transitioning the story from Dylan kind of feeling great about what he's doing and like he's on top of the world to the realization that people he loves will die for his actions. Yeah. So that's when he cuts himself off from Kira. That's when. He cuts himself off from Daisy. This gives us a, an opportunity to quickly reference her. I don't think there's enough meat on the bone to to really address her too, too much. But if someone had something to say about Daisy, now would definitely be the time. Marco definitely protected his uh, interest in Daisy earlier in the episode. Yeah, she's cool. <laughs> you can rewind 30 minutes. I, I, I had something. Go ahead, John. Go ahead. Uh, no, go ahead. 
I I thought that Daisy's sort of role was more to show us how Dylan felt about his father's um, art. Yeah. Because I think like yeah. his father, Dylan is also ashamed of his father's art and his inability to accept the way that his father made money, his inability to uh, feel comfortable putting it on display was a shame that he felt associated with his father that wouldn't go away. And be, and again, it's another representation of running away from his feelings. If he would have said, hey, this is a great way to honor my father. I thank you for doing this. This is really cool. And I think my father might have gotten a kick out of it. That's another chance for him to save himself. That's another chance for him to integrate fully his father in a healthy way into his personality. We take from our parents. He could have taken from his father. Hey, my father was a great artist. His, he did something so cool with his art that someone else saw value in it. Instead, he shunned it. He said, no, I'm ashamed of what my father was drawing and I don't want this. And that led I mean, it's not its not the real reason. It was an excuse, but he cut Daisy off an otherwise healthy relationship for that thing. Hmm. That, that's interesting. Cause I, I had viewed it as his sort of grasping of power in that it the relationship sort of started off after his first or second killing where he, he started to like really double down on it, on the idea. And, and all the interactions were based off of sex, were based off of uh, his his feeling of just like the adrenaline rush, like it was all based off things that weren't as deep as it was with Kara, but was something that was a little more just um, focused on the fact that he was on that high. Yeah. That's, that's very much was my reading of it as well. It's like, it's, it's very like, um, it's like animal almost in that way. Right. Where it's like, he, you know, he gives us the example, right. Of when he felt weak, and it's when he was, you know, he felt like he was emasculated uh, in front of her. And that insecurity ultimately leads to the end of their relationship. And when he meets her again, right, like she can like smell the confidence on him, basically. You know, she can tell that like he has a new energy about him and that like he's not that same guy who uh, has that level of insecurity. And that's attractive to her, right? Um, people respond to confidence. And I, I totally agree with Marco. Where, like, I feel like um, they even have those, like, it's, like, one of the issues in the middle of their relationship where, like, they're at dinner and, like, he's not even listening to her talking. You know, like, I, I don't think he has any real connection to her that's not related to just how she is another thing that makes him feel, you know, virile and powerful and you know like this is the new dylan i think that's all true but what is the only thing that they disagree on it's what to do with his father's art sure yeah i i don't i don't know that i agree with your reading of his shame about his father's art but i'm very interested in that and i i'd, I'd like to the next time i read the book i'm gonna keep that in mind looking at those passages because like that wasn't how I took it um, because I feel like based on the way he talks about it earlier on, um, like he, I remember he said when he was a kid, he always thought his father was like this amazing creative genius because of his art. Yeah, I, I think I agree with you, Pete. I, I think he actually kind of puts it down a pedestal and that comes up yeah. later when he's talking about his downfall. He, he t talks about his deep sadness, but also how legendary he was. And the, the the fact is, he he keeps kind of collecting his art. I I, I think he's protective of it, um, and I, I, I maybe he is a little ashamed of it. But I think he's only a little bit ashamed of it in the lens that his father was ashamed of it. If yeah, that makes sense. I I yeah, that I was gonna um, I was gonna use the phrase that I I feel like he inherited some of that shame from his dad. Not that like it's he himself who thinks there's something like inherently wrong with it. I don't think those are different. Fair. Yeah, fair point. Um, yeah, so I, I really – I thought she kind of she, – she served a purpose. I feel like she was probably not 
really a, a full character. Um, but you know, every book's got to have those. Yeah. Speaking of which, I wanted to point <laughs> out what. I thought you were gonna go to Mason. Speaking of unfleshed out characters, I was gonna Mason. say I, I, I felt like she was like about at that same level. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even feel like we needed to talk about Mason too much. I feel like we kind of addressed Mason's yeah. relevance well enough. Fake I was just going to point out uh, the the two two of the detectives in the book, Stan and Steve, and see if you guys noticed that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. I, I looked at I looked at Stan the whole time, and I went, "Why is this guy familiar?" <laughs> yeah, I had yeah. the same thought. <laughs> totally. Wait, why? I, I don't get it. Good. Huh. Don't nobody okay. tell him. All right. Listeners comment so you can inform me <laughs> and maybe other listeners who don't know. I no, mean, make fun of him. We'll tell you. <laughs> so Wait, we'll... but you know though, right, Marco? For real? I don't. No, he didn't. Oh, so <laughs> tell him. Stan Lee. Steve Dicko. Stan, Stan and Steve. Uh, yeah, yeah, and Brubaker mentioned uh, in some of the back matter that like one of the inspirations for like the when he was cra- like de- developing the story was old school like spider-man stories from the 70s so it was an homage ah, clever everyone make fun of marco in the comments i said below. do it he, so he, anyway he's... yeah uh the sort of other side of dylan in terms of the law is lily sharp who is the only law person we see throughout the entire book that has intelligence you know, real intelligence real integrity she's real um, sharp any interest in doing her job at all <laughs> yeah uh stan and steve are very much just kind of like you know whatever about it uh opposite of of the real stan lee and steve ditko they don't have any imagination <laughs> oh. uh, I feel like and... they had too much imagination. They're like, whoa, there must be a pattern here. He's leaving us clues, all that fucking shit. And there's blowing smoke up each other's asses. <laughs> well, they were they saw the patterns, but they were just wrong. Um, <laughs> or they they thought they saw patterns, but yeah, they were wrong. Making... She saw patterns and she was right. They couldn't look past the fact that the case was closed. Um, yeah. They couldn't look past the fact that she was a woman. You know, she couldn't have known anything. And I love the way that she was used to show us the corruption of uh, law enforcement uh, in, you know, in this world, whereby, you know, here's someone who's trying to do their job and people can't stop grabbing her ass to realize that she actually has something interesting to say or that she knows what she's talking about on any level. Uh, And that's something that she has to deal with quite a bit. I feel like a lot of media that has you know like we've, we've seen a lot of like like we've seen um the sopranos which is about uh you know an angry white dude we've seen breaking bad which is about an angry white dude um a lot of these kinds of stories have the you know the the corrupt cops and then the really great cop and she's the really great cop for this story mm. i wish we had spent more time with lily because I actually was intrigued by her. Uh, I wish we could have seen more about, you know, what her life is like outside of her being a detective. The fact that we don't led to her feeling more 2D. Yeah, I think she would have really benefited from a, a similar, similarly focused issue that Kira got in number seven. Like where we get to know a little bit more about who she is and why she wants to be a cop and all that kind of stuff, you know, to really... Get, like make it make it make us like believe the skin she has in the game a little bit more. I like the fact that her and Dylan see the same problems in society. Yeah, but we're not that different to you and I. <laughs> Damn, there it is. There you go. Oh god, uh, she just doesn't feel like killing people is the answer to that and when she eventually does kill someone towards the end of the book it shakes her up and it's yeah Yeah. you know she has that that line you know that she's now crossed and it's it's she has a human reaction a normal what i think is a normal human reaction to murdering any person 
uh, is to be shaken up. Whereas Dylan is, you know, I mean, at least at this point, very comfortable. Like he blows someone away with no problem. He blows a couple of people away with no problem in that very same space. Uh, and I just love the the juxtaposition of those two characters, which goes back to the conversation we had much earlier um, about, you know, their kind of her calling out his morality. Um, I, I just loved her as a character to the point where I really wish we got a lot more. Yeah, she was really good. Uh, I think you needed her. She, she was kind of a plot device, but an essential one because you needed someone in the story to juxtapose Dylan and what he was doing. Yeah. Mm. And, and that's what she offered. Mm. She's also like the only genuine foil for him in the entire thing. Like everybody else is like, doesn't see him coming or is too inept to recognize what's actually going on. Speaking of uh, don't see coming, are we going to talk about one of the more important characters, the uh, taxi driver? What Very about, important character. What That's about him, true. Marco? <laughs> Nothing. We just forgot about him. It, did we? <laughs> That's true. I remembered he was Russian. Well, well speaking please. of not seeing things coming, the Russian mob boss certainly didn't see Dylan coming. Uh, yeah. yeah, I, I love, and I love again <laughs> that showcases like how easily it was for Dylan to use. Uh, anonymity to get by, and the, the the ways in which he doesn't stand out, which might might have been something that like depressed him at an earlier stage in life, was something that actually helped him out. You know, he said that he was born when he was born. Dylan was a super common name. There were like thousands of Dylans, so the fact that his name was Dylan, the fact that they knew that didn't matter. You know, he was able to essentially play the the russian mob um just by hiding in plain sight the the fact that like that that was another one of those things that like made it feel believable right like where he orchestrates this entire thing to like uh move around their manpower and then he's just like it's kind of surprising how easy it is to like you wouldn't think you could just walk into a russian mobster's house but like realistically you probably could yeah yeah, we should try sometime. Let's see what happens. <laughs> I mean, hey, make for a good episode. I'm cool on that person. <laughs> Kel's the closest to Russia. Is he? I'll let, I'll let you know how it goes. <laughs> cool. Keep us posted. What did you guys think about Dylan ending up in the mental hospital? They should have uh, kept them on lockdown. <laughs> it's the right place for him to be, probably. <laughs> Not really their fault. The Russian mob came. It's fair. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, I don't know. When his doctor like immediately dismiss, it's like maybe, 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 I don't know, maybe look into it. Like maybe look into it a little bit when he's like, no, I'm like I'm a serial killer. It's like, well, okay. Well, the the reason they didn't was because <laughs> the there copycat. Was a- yeah. Yeah, I know. so <laughs> I'm just <laughs> I just thought that was so funny that he's just like, nah, nah, no way. <laughs> well, that sequence is used to talk about, you know, again, the the, the way we treat mental illness. Yeah. He's immediately brushed off as like, nah, this isn't true. We see the orderly who's molest, you know, molesting the um some of the, the female uh, patients there. And it's just like at every turn, this dude is highlighting what's wrong with the world. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I I really liked was when the doctor, he's talking to the doctor and he's telling the doctor, like, how do you, how do you, how is it that more people don't feel like this? And he's like, well, I think people see what you see. I think most people just don't take it so personally. Yeah, that was a really good interaction because when he asked him why he's so concerned about justice, his immediate reaction is, well, do you think this world's fair? And he's like, well, no, that's not what I'm saying. It felt like the only earnest interaction he had with the doctor because from the moment he really starts talking to him, it feels like he's... And, and, and Dylan narrates this too, where it's like, I see the look in his eye. like it, it's, it's clear where, where this is going. He's, he's diagnosed him 
at that point. He's, mm -hmm. he's already, you know, figuring out, you know, X, Y, or Z what could be the issue at that point. Phil just exhibited big robot energy. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. All right. That's what that. That's what happened. Huh? <laughs> I, was, I, I was like sitting here. I'm like, all right. Well, I'm glad I summarized that really well. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I got the gist of what you were saying. Uh, did anybody want to respond? No. No. I think I think that sums it up pretty well. Oh, so that's what the silence was about, Phil. Um, and so you're right. Great job. <laughs> yeah, great job. <laughs> well done. Uh, when he <laughs> went into the <laughs> mental institution, I remember the first read through. I was like, ah, come on, man. Like, I just, I didn't want that. I didn't want the book to slow down sure. in that way. Uh, which, you know, is the, the superhero comic lover in me. Like, come on, keep it up. Yeah. Another trope, though, is sort of exposed in that in that sequence where I feel like every every comic book character or every character who's like a comic book character at some point is in an insane asylum, whether real or perceived. <laughs> There's the uh, episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer where they tell her that it was all it was all her delusions. There's the episode <laughs> of Batman the Animated Series where you know Scarecrow has him you know. Uh, thinking that everything he's ever done was was not real or whatever, um, so yeah, I, I felt like that was another trope that was being utilized. Yeah, I, I think I felt it more in my second read through, um, but my thoughts of it kind of lead into sort of the conclusion of the the story. Mm -hmm. um, should I just go do, into that? Do your thing. I, I, the the last two issues i think or the last the second to last issue i think wraps up the story and to me outside of what brubaker sort of says the last issue felt kind of like rambling in that it was a sentence that went on for too long and hmm. i i don't i don't remember feeling that way in my first read through but I also didn't remember a lot of the specifics as much as I did some of the earlier issues, which surprised me because I feel like you typically remember the you know, beginning and the end more so than the middle. But for some reason, I remembered the middle more so. And um, on this second read through, the, the end sort of fell a little flat for me. And I was just curious if anyone else kind of felt similarly or if they were excited about the end. I read it one and a half times. Uh, I I got to I think I think actually I got to about issue fourteen on the on my second read through, um, and uh, when I got to the um, the the mental institution the the first time, it, I really felt like it ground to a halt, and I I sort of felt myself glaze over as I was reading up until the end. It's interesting. Um, it's just, oh, sorry. Go ahead. It just didn't do that much for me. Uh, so it's it's interesting because I I definitely agree with you guys that like the story slows down a lot there. Um, but I I think that this story's willingness and desire to slow itself down so often is one of the things that I I appreciated about it. Um, I I like books that are high octane and you know like fast paced, but I really appreciate comics that are willing to be meditative, you know, um, and like go to places that are a little bit slower and quieter. And I, I think that it gives, it gives the story a little bit of room to breathe, you know, and I've only read it through the one time. So Lord knows if I'd feel the same way on reread, because again, like you have, like I had things to chew on when I was reading it the first time. Now I know what happens. So. And, and just to clarify, my, I, I, I thought the the once he gets into the asylum was fine. Like I I also enjoy like when things slow down. But for me, the particular 
for lack of a better word, problem issues were the the last two. Like the for me. Sp- oh, okay, the last two. Because I thought you said that you felt like nineteen wrapped it, right? No, no. no. So yeah, nineteen nineteen sort of wrapped the story, but then like twenty kind of was, and it, 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 the the sentence rambled. I, I agree with that sentiment. Um, I don't think it it didn't like take me out of it per se, but like I feel like if you just end at nineteen with Dylan and he's just dead and it's like, he's dead. That's it. And like, you give a little wrap wrap up of like what the ramifications of his actions were or whatever. Like, I think that, you know, would have been just as effective if not more. Um, cause I, I do think that like the last issue feels like an epilogue. Um, yeah, but I also don't mind that because I, I don't know. Like I, um, I've experienced enough media where there is a thing that feels like the actual end and then you have the epilogue to kind of like tie up loose ends. And I feel like that's just kind of what it is. Like it's the, that whole issue is basically, Hey, here's the fake out, which it's a good fake out. It was a good gag. I dug that. And then it kind of gives you the context of like what actually happens with Kira and everybody else after he's gone. Well, I think that the inclusion of ep- uh, issue 20 is important because it, it it sort of adds further context to the question of what the demon is. Yes, and that's that for me is, is really where the hook sank into me. That's sort of what made the book a lot better for me. Is is when is when he goes? Oh yeah, I've been dead this whole time, and I've been talking to you or whatever. For me, that that's like okay. So this shit was real, Dude, f- fucking sweet. Huh, that's interesting. I didn't think of it that way, but I I see that reading, and I think the fact that it can be interpreted in a few different ways, and that you can like genuinely make a case for each of them is like that's good. It's just good writing. It's got layers. But also the fact that Kira now has a demon. Huh. Right. Well, and it it, right. pa- it passed from his, you know, his his da- I guess his dad, uh, to his half brother who didn't make it to his brother or to him, and then, uh, yeah, to to Kira. So you think that uh, he's in hell with like the demon? I mean, he only killed bad people. I don't feel like yeah, it was but... making a commentary about heaven or hell. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think it was just back to that supernatural aspect. Like it, yeah. it's is just sort of ambiguous. But but to that, I mean, yes, like 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 valid. That is, you know, where it's sort of oh, why issue twenty is, is included. But to to a, to. Pete's point, like the epilogue could have maybe even been attached to issue 19, where it could have just rounded off maybe a couple pages uh, immediately after what happens with Dylan uh, and then what happens with Kara. Yeah, you I don't... go to that coffee shop conversation where they explain what happened. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Maybe it's just a bias because of the superhero shit, but like. I... Real quick, something I did want to call out. Uh, to with to you specifically, Marco was. Um, did you like how like the demon kind of felt like reminiscent of like the demon bear? Like, did you get that vibe from it? In in what way? Like the like visual style of it. Like like the smoky and like the all black and stuff, and like the teeth, and the way that like it's like it makes use of negative space and stuff like that. Huh. I got like, I had it. vibes of that while I was reading it. Interesting. I don't know. Personally, I feel like issue 20 is pretty important. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. And I, I also really loved how the book slips into Kira becoming the main character. And again, it goes back to the passing of the mantle um, where now she's talking to us. Now mm. she's probably going to start killing people. Um, and it's because she she crossed that threshold. Whatever it was that allowed her to smile through the bad stuff is gone. She doesn't have that anymore. And now 
that's what has allowed the demon to enter into her mind. And she's going to presumably do what Dylan did. So, Sean, how does that influence your reading of it? Where, like, you, you said earlier that you don't feel like the demon was real. Um, do you think that that's just supposed to be, like, a metaphor for her? Like, I guess, like, activating in that way or whatever? Or do you feel like you're maybe supposed to feel like there's some truth to it? Or I think she broke. Hmm. And that the, the, the demon is just the representation of that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but really I, sure I, I also, I <laughs> yeah, and, and that's probably a, an interesting way to, you know, get us to closing out is what do you guys ultimately think now that we've reached the end, now that we've talked about the way this whole thing resolves, what do you think? Was it real? I, I legitimately yeah. don't know. Um, I really think that there's a compelling argument for both angles of it, particularly when you think of it through the lens of, a point I think it was Marco who made earlier where, like, it could just be the demon preying on people who have mental illness um, because it's a great explanation for when they get caught, right? Um, so I don't know. Um, but I think I, it doesn't really matter either way. And the fact that you kind of get to have that, um, I guess to weirdly bring up the Inception parallel again, that moment of, like, that sparks the debate of, like, was it real? You know, like... And does that matter? Does that does that influence your reading of it? You know, um, because of, I don't know. Sh and should it? I guess. Yeah, I, I I definitely think the demon after after that fact, I'm like, oh shit, like it exists. Um, but I don't think it affects my my reading because he, it's it's sort of like you know in 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 most literature, demons are sort of meant to like antagonists. They, they sort of poke at you and prod at you and, and to get you to sort of, sort of cross, cross a line. And I think that it, that fit very well and was in line with what I've typically experienced demons to be in media. So um, it, it, it made it so that it fit the narrative, but at the same time, I think that it doesn't affect what we had seen before or what we had seen of Dylan and, and, you know, his, his thought processes and, and his actions. Um, if anything, it sort of just opened the doors to like, oh shit, now like what is Kira going to do and like why and how is it based off of her past? Um, that sort of, it, it, that, that's the way it sort of left me. Um, I, I, again, I don't think it really matters. I, I, and even at the end, it, it's a manifestation of, 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 her now, now having to confront this, this, um, this kind of this darkness that's coming over her, and whether or not it's real, it's not really the point. It's, it's emblematic of of, of self destruction, I think, and I think that's really what it is. Hmm. So you don't think the demon exists? It doesn't. I, 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 I don't think it matters. But, so yeah, but so he yeah, think? he doesn't think so. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I I prefer the reading where the demon exists, especially when coupled with the idea that the uh, the narration is being told from uh, dead Dylan. Um, I think I think with that sort of. Um, uh that that extra layer of of meta text where dead dylan you know looking over everything that happened could see the demon um you know i like i i feel like if it weren't real dead dylan would be like ah that's not real like i feel like he would probably leave it out or he would say something something like mm -hmm. yeah and i've seen demons or some shit so I it, that that did a lot for me. Well, it looks like the demon got filled because it's dark in there. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Kill the comics pals. <laughs> <laughs> we are all Let's pretty evil. Uh, well, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about Sean Phillips 
and Elizabeth Brettweiser and what they contributed to this story. Because I think that, you know, we talked about the relationship between Sean and, and Ed and how long standing that's been and how uh, it really does feel like two people who are, you know, at the top of their game. And I, I really love the artwork in this book. I think it's it's tremendous looking. There are several instances where I, I really um, was drawn into what they were doing. And I, one of the things that I love so much about Sean Phillips' artwork is his ability to uh, draw sequences where there are a lot of people yeah, and make it look... Mm normal and natural and everybody's kind of in their own zone like i'm just on a random page uh this is um in the last issue where we're just it's just dylan's narration and we're seeing all these different people and it's like they're all living their own life uh they're all like having a conversation or deep in thought or something or smiling or laughing and it's like you get so much personality out of all these random people here. I love that. Yeah, and, like, it never uh, falls into that, like, habit that, like, it always really bothers me when, um, like, backgrounds are kind of, like, obscured, you know, and everything just feels, like, shapeless. Uh, it never really feels uh, like I don't know about that. I mean, there I don't, are, I don't there think... There are a, Go ahead. a few moments where it's but kind of rough. I don't I don't think when it when it's groups of people that's as much of a problem though. And I think that's where you often see that and I feel like that's where it's the most noticeable to me because like you expect people to have features and faces whereas like I think the the one time where the the background was real messy that stood out to me was when he's talking to that guy at the newsstand. Um but that was really the only time where I remember it like stuck out to me. I think we'd be remiss not to talk about the really crazy pulp spreads too. The like, um, like, the, like you, showing the father's art. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's definitely great. Um, that was there was so much attention to detail there, and it, it looked so distinct. It was really really neat. And I, I liked. Um, there was a lot of those pages that they felt like very reminiscent to me of uh, actually of, of the, what we talked about in Daredevil Born Again, where there was like the pages with the the white bar along the side where there would be the kind of the narration and then like the imagery and like that. Um, that kind of goes back to like old Nor comics, too, which is like a cool nod to that style. Like I, I was neat that we read those like back to back from these two months because um, I don't know that I would have like picked up on that otherwise and phil that that pulp stuff it looked like uh what, imp what always impressed me was like it, it looked like a completely different artist drew that yes like the, 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 yeah. it almost felt like it was a different medium it was uh different lighting it was different colors it was crazy that that, that was cool yeah all and, around the art team it was like the distinction it, it really did look like a different person made that i can't imagine how long that took sean phillips the 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 colors um uh, going back to that like pulp noir style is you know the 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 pinks purples greens uh the oranges like the 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 color palettes are very inspired and then especially like the action moments and then in some of the softer more i guess more quiet sections it's you know a, a general day outside in the sun or you're like a regular night out it's, it's just kind of dark and overcast or it's a like a sunny day but uh in between the the moments where there are there's consistent dynamics you 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 get the color to sort of accentuate a lot just like it pops against it i i love the way that it like you you really get a mood from the color you know like you look at the first issue yeah. where they show the the scene that we keep going back to of all those guys getting gunned down and like it's very like dingy and grimy and like there's these harsh red backgrounds that like give you that feeling of like blood and you know like it feels violent it feels visceral and you compare that to like the scenes where you know they're like quietly laying in bed or something like that or to your point mark like walking through the park or something like that um and the the mood feels like dramatically different you know mm. One of my favorite aspects of <clears throat> Sean Phillips' art are his inks, especially. 
like he he uses them to add definition to clothing a lot of the time mm -hmm. um uh, or, or like a, a look on a face that um what is it francesco francovilla yeah. uh, i think he also does something similar with like his shadows and yeah. i love that kind of stuff there's a an issue in issue nine where he's fighting the the russian that's inside the uh the truck like you just see uh it, it's like a more like of a, of a night scene but a lot of it is um half faces uh you, you get the profiles it's just it, it's i i love his art yeah yeah there's a there's a page um uh, issue three it's so page 16 that i just really love uh it's, it's a really really gorgeous page it's kira and and dylan speaking on like a i don't know a pier or something like that and it's really it's like not a it's not a big deal page but it's just beautiful the way her hair the reds of it yeah it's contrast the with like the the grays of the background i i just i don't know there's something about this page that really does it for me the, that's when they're they're at coney island right are they yep. i think yeah. so yeah oh. yeah the cyclone right yeah it's definitely coney island yeah they're by astroland now that we've placed it uh <laughs> sorry <laughs> Yeah, just love the art. I think it's tremendous. Yeah, I, I, I think that 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 scene was really memorable too because I think the the dialogue or the narration there is really great. Um, like I really like. There's the line where it's that she had this oddly sad way of looking at the world, kind of like she was mourning every beautiful thing she saw. Mm. Um, and I think that with the context of it being at this like very, like famous place that is like famous because it's old and untouched and that it's also while it's snowing and empty and like kind of dead um there's something like very kind of like morbidly romantic about it yeah like a hot topic <laughs> yes yeah it's yeah <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> that's exactly the energy that i'm talking about <laughs> i love the nightmare before christmas too what a beautiful day for a wedding Damn, we 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 referenced it a, a couple times, but um, the issue seven where it's like the Kira issue, it's all photographs, and I like that they're artistically. You know, we've, we've spoken in the past, like artistically, they they allow themselves to sort of play outside the box, and mm -hmm. a lot of those sequences are just like photographs, photographs, and then text. The same way you would see in like some sort of of a uh, like like a binder, a collection of just different instances um uh so yeah just like playing outside of the form as well is really really cool the six panels the nine panel grids like uh all super just inventive stuff man i i and i really love seeing two um well three in this case masters of the craft break all the rules yeah, it's it's really fun to watch because, again, you know, when you read superhero comics uh, and, and f to be honest, like even non superhero comics, they really are formulaic in a lot of ways. Mm. And this book is not that. Um, and it's not that. And it's also not that in a way that enhances the story. It's not a detriment. Sometimes creators might try some stuff and maybe they're lesser creators or just didn't work out for whatever reason but it can take away from what it is that you're that you're reading what it is that you're that you're looking at yeah and i don't think that that was ever really the case here yeah like i feel like um it's kind of one of those old adages right that like you have to really know the rules to be able to break them i think in a way that like matters you know um i think we really appreciate works that are unique and that give us something that we haven't seen before and that like feel like they're trying to break new ground um but i also don't think that this book is so alien that it's not um it's not something that i don't think you could recommend to a new reader right like and i think that's a problem with a lot of the so, or not a lot but i'll say many comics that break conventions um that was something that we, i remember we talked about in our like our space writers um 
review, that was something that I remember you and I specifically calling out, Sean, where it was like sometimes it was just like hard to follow because it was so breaking the conventions that the things that you're kind of trained to know how to do like as a, as a reader of comics um, go out the window. And this book right. doesn't do that. It doesn't need to do that. It can like be something that is digestible and uh, accessible while also like playing with conventions and forms and, and trying to do new things uh, that are like by and large very successful. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I never cease to be impressed by what these two and Elizabeth is a frequent collaborator. So what these three are capable of. And I think that when it comes to all three of them doing some of their best work, this is really a book that shines for that. So if you're looking for great artwork, uh, alongside great writing, this is the book for you. Although if you're listening to this, I'm pretty sure you've read it. Or at least I, I hope, hope so. so. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it, it reminds like, what do you mean issue seven? What happens in issue seven? Uh, <laughs> it, it, it reminds me of, of uh, one of the final notes that we left on, on Daredevil Born Again, where this is one of those books that it's really like, there's not one thing that stand out good. It's like, it's people who are across the board really like hitting you know, heights of, of the medium and like those things working in tandem to make something that is like more than the sum of its parts. Yeah. So uh, let's talk about our final thoughts and, and get out of here. Uh, Phil, what are your final thoughts on the book? And would you recommend it? Of course. No. <laughs> um, Great. Hell yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I um I liked it. it. It genuinely made me feel things. You know, last month we talked about Daredevil moving me to tears. This this made me feel gross. It made me feel depressed. Uh and it made me feel kind of nostalgic to like in in a weird way to like uh like trying to figure out my own shit at uh different points in my life when i was younger yeah and i think i think this was I, funny it's... i think if you pitched this idea from a lesser creative team it would have the tropes you kept alluding to so often Sean, would have come out as just being kind of hackneyed and bad mm -hmm. but this mm -hmm. team is so good and, and they crafted something so so thoughtful um i would definitely recommend this book i, I think i think it's a i think this is like a really solid book. um pete yeah i i echo a lot of phil's sentiments i i i really do think this is i thought this was a great book um like i said i i i really found it hard to put down like I started reading it um, a few days before our uh, our our recording date, and you know I had given myself enough time, knowing that it was five issues or uh, twenty issues that I I only really needed to read like you know maybe like five a day, um, and I I would have had enough time, um, but I I like couldn't put it down, you know I like read it through my lunch break the day that I started it, like I um, I was every free second I had while I was reading it, I wanted to get back to it. And I haven't really experienced that level of, um, of, of really wanting to get to the next chapter in a book in quite some time. Uh, and I, I think it's because of all the things that we've been saying, right? Like, it, it's a book that has a lot of nuance and it has layers. And um, to Phil's point, I think I've read very similar stories by lesser writers. Um, I can think of probably more popular stories that are very similar that are not as good. Uh, and I, uh, I, I, I would definitely recommend it. I, I think it's, it's a, a really unique book. Um, but I also think it's a very accessible book. Kill. Uh, yeah, I echo the same. Um, it's, it's probably not the, um, the brew baker book that I feel the strongest about. Um, so I, it probably wouldn't be my first recommendation, um, but I, I, you know, 
I wouldn't, I would still put it up there and, you know, the, 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 the good works of Brubaker and Phillips and, and Brett Weiser. Um, so yeah, no, it's good. How about you, Marco? Yeah, this was the this was the book that I think for me solidified that Brubaker, Phillips, Brettweiser were like a dynamic team. Like it was again the second book that I'd ever read of theirs. So this is this is what sort of launched me to want to go back to their criminal stuff, Fatal, uh, Velvet, all all of that. And so I, uh, I very much would recommend this to somebody who's looking for a relatively short crime series. And um, maybe with, if they're into like the violence of it, then you know that's probably another aspect of it. Um, but yeah, it, this is excellent, excellent work from some creators. I, I really enjoy reading them. For both you and and Sean Marco, where does this book rank amongst the Brew Baker Phillips books for you guys? I I've only read this, um, Fade Out, and some Criminal velvet i think i have that i just haven't touched yet and then fatal i've not read so of of all that stuff as of right now it's the fade out that 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 i think is probably my, my favorite work of theirs but obviously there's like more to read of of them and and all that so uh that's right that's where i stand currently yeah um it's hard to answer that because of the fact that I haven't reread all that stuff and, I'll, and quite a bit of it is like far from me now. Um, but with that being said, this is this is probably the book that I that I enjoyed the most. Uh, I really loved Fatal. I really loved Velvet. Um, but this book hit me hard because it deals with a lot of themes that are recurring in my life, questions that I ask myself a lot, as you can tell by some of the books that we've done. Um, and so because of those things, this just does it for me. Uh, so I would put Kill or Be Killed at the top of my list. Nice. Um, I could see myself feeling pretty similarly. Yeah, yeah, and I and I highly recommend Incognito, which we didn't shout out on this on this episode. I highly recommend, you know, just for the Brewbreaker side of things, his Captain America run. There's a lot of great content out there. These are two creators who you really should uh, go and check out the rest of their work, especially if you like crime stuff. Apparently, twenty this, years worth of it that I've missed. So lots yeah, to read. <laughs> yeah, uh, this book I feel like tells a really powerful story. Uh, I'm glad that I got to read it when I did and I'm glad that we read it for this book club um, I feel like there are a lot of Dylans out there yeah. and I feel like there are a lot of people who are Dylan that you don't even think about you might be Dylan not necessarily out there killing people but really bummed out about the state of the world and um, you know whether or not you're going to do something about it i think is a question that we all have to ask ourselves mm -hmm. and never in comics have i really felt like a book dealt with those things better than this even with all the superhero comics i've read so really pleased that we did this book club um hats off to the creative team for another stellar book on their part i would recommend this to pretty much anybody unless they just didn't like uh non-superhero comics for some reason um but yeah you're a little squeamish about violence maybe <laughs> definitely yeah, a bloodbath it, it, oh yeah big time I would, I would recommend this to anybody who likes stories similar to breaking bad or the wire or sopranos i think it's it's on that level of quality and also on that level of depth or like if you get fight club <laughs> right yeah exactly hey, what's the uh, first rule with that being said though we are the Comics Pals. We really hope that you guys enjoyed what we did here. Uh, this is something we do once a month. The book clubs are uh, – it's, it's, it's a big part of what we do. 
each month we pick a book or a listener suggests a book and we tackle it. We give it a deep dive, hopefully what we consider to be a deep dive. and Hopefully you guys feel the same way. Uh, but this is not the only thing we do because the Comics Pals is a weekly podcast where the five of us, hopefully, get together to talk about what's going on in the industry at large, uh, what is happening as far as Marvel, DC, Image, you know, all that good stuff. We do talk about superhero comics. This isn't, we, we don't only talk about image books. Um, and we've, you know, we've got a back catalog of pff, how many episodes have we done? Almost 200 that we've done. So uh, we review the movies. We review TV shows sometimes. So lots of different stuff for you guys to check out. And if you want to do that and you want to join the conversation, you can look us up at the Comics Pals. You will absolutely find us wherever your social media is sold or wherever you consume your podcast. If you want to talk to us, you can write to us at the comics at gmail.com. You can hit us up on YouTube where it would be really awesome. If you subscribe to our channel for more cool stuff like this, you can leave us a like as well and support what we do by joining our discord server where we do take recommend recommendations for future book clubs. Uh, We've got a channel where you can do that. We've got a channel where you can ask us questions. And we're constantly interacting with the people who are already there, except for Phil, who sucks. <laughs> so come hang out with us over there. We'd really appreciate it. And so with that being said, until next time, guys, take care. And thank you for listening. We are the Comics Pal signing off.